Good evening, everyone. Welcome um, to the OPC's first program in a new series titled How I Did It. I'm Patricia Kranz. I'm the executive director of the OPC. Um, our goal with this program is to offer our many freelance members and students and uh, any journalist um, the opportunity to interact with highly successful uh, practitioners of our trade. And tonight um, we're speaking with Nadia Drost and Kit Reckless, and they're going to discuss the story they published in the California Sunday Magazine about migrants crossing the Darien Gap, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. Marina Walker, who's a governor of the OPC, will moderate. Marina is executive editor at the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. She uh, was a leader for 14 years at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, where she managed two of the largest collaborations of reporters in journalism history, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. Marina was instrumental in developing ICIJ's model of large scale media collaboration. Uh, I'm very proud to say that Marina won an OPC Foundation scholarship back in 2004. So we're, we've come full circle here now that she's a governor of the OPC. So with that, I'll hand it over to Marina. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning if you're in a different time zone. Thank you, Patty, for the kind introduction. I am incredibly excited and honored to moderate the first conversation in this new How I Did It series by the Overseas Press Club. The conversation today will focus on Nadia Dross reporting on the extraordinary journey of migrants from around the world who travel the dangerous Darien Gap to reach the US. The Darien Gap is a roadless mountainous jungle straddling the Colombia-Panama border. In recent remarks, Nadia described the migrants' harrowing journey as a man-made tragedy in an otherwise paradisiacal wilderness. A long form piece about the Darien Gap she wrote for California Sunday Magazine was awarded the 2021 Pulitzer Prize for Feature Writing. A television series about the Darien Gap in which Dross reported with videographer Bruno Federico for the PBS NewsHour was recognized with an Emmy and a Peabody Award. And just a few days ago, we learned that Nadia received the prestigious Michael Kelly Award given annually by The Atlantic. In their commendation, the judges <clears throat> described Trust as a meticulous and kind reporter, deeply committed to the truth and to the people she reports on. So for her piece in the California Sunday Magazine, Nadia worked with editor Kit Rackliss, who is with us today as well. Welcome, Kit. Rackliss is a senior editor at ProPublica. In addition to California Sunday Magazine, Rackliss also worked at The Atlantic, LA Weekly, and The American Prospect, among other publications. So the format for today's conversation is going to be the following. I will kick off the conversation with Nadia and Kit. And after about 20 minutes or so, 25 maybe, we'll open up for questions from you. So please uh, free, feel free to start leaving the questions in the chat as, you, as they pop up in your mind. And you will also have the opportunity to raise your hand and to um, go on mute and ask your question yourself, uh, if that's what you choose to do. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Nadia, let me start with you. What is the origin of this amazing story and how did it all start? Uh, thanks, Marina. So I had lived in Colombia for uh, a decade before I started recording this story. And when I lived there, I'd heard of this migration route. Uh, once in a while, I would see local press accounts, perhaps a boat of migrants had capsized, perhaps Colombian authorities had uh, apprehended African migrants making their way through Colombia on their way to Panama. Um, and it was always just kind of these random accounts. So I knew that the route existed, but it was only in, I would say, maybe like the two years before um, I started reporting the story. I noticed that the numbers really had started to rise. And so that made me 
very curious about why, you know, what kind of um, what kind of push factors perhaps were we're bringing migrants to this part of the world. Why were so many people um, from such disparate places um, taking this route? So I became really curious about not only why was this route becoming more trafficked, but who were the people who were taking them and, and what was their experience? And so um, I decided with uh, my partner and videographer Bruno uh, that we wanted to try doing a story, I had the great advantage that um, I was able to learn from a past attempt that Bruno had taken uh, to cross part of the Darien Gap the year before, and it really didn't go well. And he came back with a lot of hard earned, um, but really good lessons. And I also had the benefit of speaking a lot with Carlos Villalon, who's a Chilean photographer in, in Colombia who has made the Derian um, his kind of long-term project for the last decade and who had already crossed a couple of times. And so talking with the two of them, we started to piece together um, what we wanted to try to do, would it be possible to cross and how. And that's when I approached the Pulitzer Center uh, for funding when we realized this was gonna be a very, very costly trip to do safely uh, and approach the PBS NewsHour to do a series and kit at California Sunday. So did you pick a uh, kit first or California Sunday first? Kit. Uh, kit and I had already worked together on a story a few years earlier. Um, it was a, a shorter and kind of different type of story, but um, he so he he was um yeah my go-to person at, at california sunday kit uh tell us uh, what what your first impression was uh when you got the pitch from nadia well you know unbeknownst to nadia i had been deeply interested in assigning a piece about the darien gap at california sunday i had edited a piece about 18 or 19 months before about tijuana which was called the city of exiles and it was a piece about how you know migrants were coming up from the south from and also enormous number of people were being deported uh, by the Trump administration um, into Mexico and into Tijuana and there was this huge convergence and um, in the piece there was a paragraph that referred to a group of migrants asylum seekers um, from North Africa from Pakistan from Bangladesh um, who had come through the Darien Gap. And there was a brief description of the Darien Gap. And I went, that's an extraordinary piece. Someone needs to do this piece. And I looked up what had been done and there'd been two pieces. One was a peculiar kind of eco-tourism piece that was seven or eight years before in the New Yorker. And one was a piece in the Outside Magazine, which was mostly about the writer's own experience and to a large, large degree ignored the experience of the migrants. Um, and so I actually asked the writer of the Tijuana piece whether he was interested and he looked at me aghast and said, you know, he was Ill completely ill-equipped to do this piece. Asked one other person, they got the same response within a week or so and put it aside the way one does. Yeah. And then I got Nadia's proposal, which was um, the equivalent of, you know, six pages, if I recall correctly. Um, and it was so smart. Um, clearly knew you know, what the story was. Um, you know, and when editors say something so smart it is, it, it agreed with my perspective. Um, and two, she had really begun to think about the logistics. And then three, there was the financial support from the Pulitzer Center, which was big because California Sunday's idea of an expensive trip is, or expenses was $2,500 or $3,000. It wasn't what this number was. Um, and called up Nadia. We had, I think, you know, a half an hour, 45 minute conversation. It only confirmed to me that this was an extraordinary piece and she was exactly the right person to do it. Um, and brought it to the editor in chief of California Sunday. And I think who knew that I was interested in this and that I thought it was the right piece for the magazine. And I think he approved it within three days. That's incredible. 
I understand uh, through my conversation with you in preparation for this event that there was a little bit of creative tension at the beginning in terms of how to approach the reporting part of this story. And it came down to the question of whether uh, Nadia joining migrants in the journey through the Daring Gap, uh, whether her presence there would alter or affect in any way the story. Um, yeah. yeah. And, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can we talk about? Can we talk about that? Maybe. Uh, go ahead, Keith. So, I mean, Nadia and I began to talk about this right away, which is that one of the challenges that Nadia was going to face is a challenge that you know foreign correspondents face in all sorts of circumstances, which is if she was going to observe migrants going through the Darien Gap, it wasn't going to be a piece about her, but about the migrants. Um, how would her presence affect their experience? And if you know, she helped a migrant who had hurt themselves or provided them with a tent or um, gave them food, that would actually change their experience. Um, and yet not to do that raises all sorts of horrific ethical issues. Um, so my thought was, which turned out to be completely wrong, and Nadia was completely right, was to borrow from a pretty famous piece 16 years before, or longer than that, 18 years before, um, by Sonia Desario at the LA Times called Enrique's Journey, which was quite extraordinary, also a Pulitzer winning piece, extraordinary story of young boy who traveled on the, the, the terrible train up through Mexico and arrived in the United States. And what Sonia had done was interview Enrique for hours so she could reconstruct his journey. And then afterwards, she took the journey herself under somewhat safer conditions. And that's what I proposed to Nadia. And Nadia can explain why she thought this was not a good idea. And, um, and Nadia was completely right. Nadia, tell so us a little bit what their position was on this. So I think, um... I felt like I wanted to be able to observe the migrants who were going to become protagonists in the story. I wanted to be able to observe them on, on the journey. Um, and I think I felt concerned that maybe I wouldn't be able to do a, a great job and a really detailed job if I was only basing the story on, on reconstruction. Um, I think I also remember, and, and maybe I hadn't voiced this so strongly to Kit, I think I was also a little bit worried about energy level um, because I think that at the start of a reporting trip, you have to be really high energy and you have to maintain it throughout. And I think I was also a little bit concerned that if I first went to Panama and I was trying to um, you know, reconstruct this journey that I hadn't yet done, and then started the Darien Gap, it might, you know, I might actually be exhausted by the time I started the Darien Gap trip. And um, I think I just didn't really have the, the confidence in a way to be interviewing migrants and trying to select who would be the protagonists in Panama and know what questions to ask them about a journey that I hadn't yet done um, and, and then not really be able to kind of see them in their environment as they experience part of this journey. What ended up happening was that I, I didn't in fact walk the entire distance with the group of migrants who I focused on and it ended up being a mix of direct observation and then days of reconstruction. And another um, benefit or reward from this approach, Nadia, um, you mentioned before that is that maybe the trust that you were able to develop um, as you became a little bit more legitimate in their eyes, uh, legitimize your presence there by, by sharing and, and just going along and, and facing some of the same dangers um, and circumstances. Absolutely. It was so helpful. Um, you know, I did all of the kind of big, long interviews with migrants um, once they had already left the trail and they were in this migrant camp in Panama where they were actually, they had, they were forced to wait for security vetting and it ended up being the perfect place to interview them because 
they were relaxed at that point. They had finished the trail, they were bored. Uh, so they were interested in speaking to a journalist, but because either we had spent a lot of time on the trail or even if they had met me for the first time, but they knew that I had been on the trail, it was kind of like this automatic street cred. Um, and I think that it gained a lot of legitimacy in, in their eyes. Um, and we could just have really rich conversations. So I want to go back to, to this in a minute, uh, but I wanted to ask Kit, as uh, this trip was being prepared, I'm, think, I'm pretty sure that you were thinking already, anticipating the writing. So is there any piece of advice that you gave Nadia before she left that you think can be helpful to other writers, reporters in similar circumstances? That's a really good question. Um, and Nadia may have a better memory of this than I. You know, I think one of the things that I said to her and I've said to other writers, which is that, um, that it's very easy in the moment, particularly when you're doing this kind of deeply observed piece um, to forget the kind of random ideas and observations you make. And um, that um, and that you need to have a place, whether it's in you know your notebook, um, where you write all of those down, you know, in a kind of a collection of ideas, thoughts, um, and not to let them pass by, not assume you'll remember them when you're in front of the computer three months later. Um, and that those go beyond simply detailing what you're seeing, but your thoughts about what you're seeing. Um, and I think I, you know, my memory is that I encourage Nadia very much to trust those ideas um, and that they would prove really useful and rich later on. And I'll, I'll add something. I remember that, um, you know, Kit and I, I think really agreed on the type of piece that we wanted this to be before I, I left on this reporting trip. We really wanted to center this piece on the experience of the migrants themselves and um, write it as though it was basically over the shoulder of one of them. But Kit just reminded me before I left, you know, just to keep focused on what, what, what is this experience like for them? Because obviously it was very, very, even though we were walking in the same places, um, we were walking in very different positions from very different backgrounds with different resources. And my experience was obviously going to be so different from from their experience and that really became a kind of a north star for a lot of my reporting just to always keep in mind you know that i i want to understand what this journey is like for them and my reporting really was centered on on that question and that brings us to the question of power dynamics they always exist uh, in any reporting situation but maybe they are more acute in a situation where these migrants are in such an incredibly vulnerable position um, how did you address uh, that those power dyna dynamics to to fully get their trust so i think that um you know when one thing was um on the trail when we met migrants of course, they were very surprised to, to see us. And um, we immediately explained our, our role as, as journalists. And I often, you know, waited quite a long time. It could have been hours or, you know, days um, before kind of expressing any type of interest in, in interviewing somebody necessarily. And, um, I focused a lot in just building up rapport with, with the people who I was walking with. Um, there were a lot of times where I actually, you know, there wasn't even really much prompting necessary. And sometimes stories, information would just kind of overflow. Um, there, I think the, the big kind of power difference was in, that most migrants start out on this trail with smugglers who after the first day or two abandon them. And in our case, we had hired smuggler guides for the entire trip. Um, they abandoned us, you know, probably eight hours before, um, and it was a planned abandonment okay. um, before we, we reached the, the trail's end. And um, so obviously by us having these guides with us, this provided us with a 
really huge safety net. That was the whole point. And so to migrants, I think we really represented that safety net. And so we never, um, we never pressured migrants to, to walk together. It was kind of naturally advantageous to them. I think they immediately, they immediately saw that. Um, a lot of people who we came across had already been robbed of all of their possessions. Um, a lot of them had either, you know, very little food left or hadn't eaten in days and days. And so just seeing anybody in the jungle who wasn't um, going to rob them, they, they automatically kind of start moving together, safety in numbers, right? In our case, um, we had guides who were able to advise on, you know, don't cross the river here, it's too deep, it's too dangerous. Um, they, they knew the Debian like the back of their hand, um, we weren't getting lost with them. So migrants kind of naturally wanted to, to walk with us. Um, but I think the key was never telling them, never giving instructions on what to do or not. You know, the choice was, was always theirs. Um, and I think the, some of the more difficult decisions um, revolved around, you know, the different resources. So as I mentioned, most of them hadn't eaten a day, in days um, by some point on, on the trail. And so we had to decide whether or not we were gonna share our food. And these were people who, you know, we were walking with, sleeping with, um, camping with. And so we did decide to share our food. I think it would have been quite an untenable reporting situation when you're when you're embedded with, with a group like that for us to have been eating and them to not be eating. Um, and I also feel like it was the right thing. It was the right thing to do. Were there um, any situations that you totally had not anticipated and where you had to make a judgment call on the spot? Uh, I think one of the, um, there were there were a lot of um, unexpected kind of challenges just getting onto the migrant trail. Um, so there were kind of a chain of many disasters. We weren't expecting um, that it would be so difficult to get on the migrant trail um, and to join up with it. And so we had to sometimes make some pretty split decisions in front of Panamanian uh, military officials who had basically surrounded this hamlet that we were in and were not letting us leave the town. Um, so those were unexpected logistical challenges. I think that the most um, kind of the, the toughest moment in terms of making an ethical decision was when we came across a Cameroonian who is in the piece, his name is George, and he had been left behind by his group. He was very injured. Um, he was basically either hobbling or crawling. Um, and he, he really begged us to take him with us and to carry him. And it was one of these moments where I felt like either the only way to transport him out would be to basically abandon our entire reporting trip um, and try to construct something, a stretcher and get our guides to try to carry him. Um, the guides you know, decided this was impossible. There was, he's a large man, um, but that was a very, that was a very difficult moment um, where I felt like I was choosing between a reporting trip and, um, and helping someone who was in dire need, but also knowing that he was definitely not gonna be the only one we were gonna come across in that situation. I wanna add something, which is that that scene is in the piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and um, it should also be added, and it said, it's, it's also reported in the piece, which is the Cameroonians felt enormously guilty about leaving him behind. And when they got to the migrant camp in Panama, pool their money to hire someone to find him. He did emerge from the Darien Gap. Um, and this is not in the story, um, but he was the first person to, um, to cross the US border um, for the, before the other Cameroonians to seek asylum. Um, that is incredible. Um, but it's, I think one of the most powerful scenes in the piece is exactly this moment when you see his panic and he's wondering, you know, what he's going to do and whether he's going to die and the guides 
you know, he's, um, his shoulder is seriously hurt and they try to repair it a little bit. Um, and it's, you know, and it is a, it is, it's a kind of naked moment in the story. Um, Kit, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship of trust between the two of you. Uh, you only had worked together once on a story that um, uh, was not at all as involved as this one. Um, but you had, there, there was this incredible trust from the beginning. So how did that develop? How do you cultivate it? Well, you know, I think it's, it's on one hand very simple, on the other hand, like all relationships, complicated. Um, Nadia and I and the photo editor um, of, of California Sunday, I think spoke on average once every two weeks, once every 10 days um, to discuss the logistics of the piece, or the logistics of, of, of the journey. And, and so just out of those conversations, you know, without, it was unspoken, we began to have a level of trust. Um, you know, Nadia understood we did not want her to take unnecessary risks. There obviously was a huge risk in the piece itself. Um, and so all of those conversations, I think, built up a level of trust. It was also when Nadia returned, you know, we had a series of conversations about the piece and the nature of the piece. And um, and at some point before she began writing, she sent me a memo, which I just looked at again this morning, um, about kind of theme of the story, what the story was about, what her characters were and what her outline was. And we had another long conversation about all of that. Um, and then, you know, you know, Nadia and I have discussed this before, which was the, on one hand, the editing process was not ideal for a lot of reasons. We were under a ferocious <laughs> deadline and it meant that, um, and I hate doing this, Nadia was sending me chunks of the piece and that I would be editing while she was writing other, the next chunks of the piece. And is any editor on this Zoom call, I suspect feels the same way. You wanna see the whole thing before yeah. you plunge in and edit. And so editing it piecemeal is a difficult process. Um, but even in editing piecemeal, we had a number of phone calls and, and then we, you know, we did something which I, I believe is really important. Um, other people think it's completely nutty and crazy. But when we were all, you know, when we, I had sent back, Nadia had done her revisions, I had sent back edits of the revision, and we were now down to the last five or six or 7% of the piece um, of things we had to look at. We, I then, we then got on the telephone, um, and which I really do believe is important at the last stage, because I think, email is terrible for conversation. And we then began at the top of the piece and we would read it quietly. Sometimes we would read it out loud. There would be a note from Nadia having a question about something. There'd be a note um, um, I would have, and we would discuss it through. And we, um, and please people don't be so horrified by this. I, we spent an entire day. We spent nine hours from something like nine o'clock in the morning till, you know, was midnight, I think, or something, um, Nadia's time, going over line by line, word by word for the piece. And you develop an enormous amount of trust and you have a real sense of each other by the end of it. But we had talked enormously up to that point. Um, so, um, and I wanna say, you know, we took breaks during that nine hours, uh, but we Can't were- let me eat and drink my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and Nadia let me make a coffee run as well, but it was, but it's out of those deep conversations that you get to know someone and understand what their concerns are, where, you know, what, you know, where, you know, you know it, it wasn't as if we agreed on everything, but we knew, and I think this is really crucial, we knew how to disagree. Um, and that was enormously valuable. And there was one important uh, piece of disagreement, right? The coda or the ending of the story. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Nadia? Sure. So um, our original vision for the piece was that I would be focusing on um, the character's journeys through the Darien Gap, but that I would also include what was happening to them in another country of their journey. And from the beginning, we didn't know which country that was going to be, and we decided that would be determined through the course of reporting. 
And um, so it ended up making a lot of sense for me to catch up with specifically the Cameroonian group in Southern Mexico when they unexpectedly really got stuck and were not able to leave Southern Mexico for the US border. And uh, the, the couple weeks that I spent with them there were far more dramatic than I had imagined. It was really kind of action packed. I was able to observe so much uh, directly. And so the original vision was that I was going to have, you know, a pretty substantial part of the piece be based in, in Mexico. We were even thinking um, about ending the piece in the United States um, when certain people had, had crossed over. And this reporting process was long enough that you know, I, I was tracking migrants um, as they moved through these different countries. And then once they um, kind of went into the, I mean, at, there was a point where all of them just went dark and they, you know, went into the black hole of either Mexican immigration detention or ICE um, facilities in the US. In any case, um, the, the disagreement that, that Kit and I had was that, you know, there was so little time in the end, we were up against this deadline. Um, the, my drafts were just enormously long. Kit had to do this, I mean, really Herculean job of not only cutting, but reshaping. And so what it meant was that um, I still could not, I didn't have time to start writing the Mexico section um kit at one point said to me he's like we're we're going to edit it and i want you to do the revisions of what we have so far and then we're going to write mexico as a coda basically and so that that's what we did and the coda just it never made it into the final piece and i mean kit can explain you know what he thought of the coda and and other editors at california sunday magazine um, but for me, it was it was a crushing moment because I felt like it was it was so important to their journeys and and I felt that there was just really dramatic material there. So um, I know we all have to kill our darlings, but this was a really big darling to to kill. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your thinking on this? Yeah. Uh, so it, you know, it was really clear in terms of both the length of what Nadia was writing and our timing that we weren't gonna be able to, in the piece on the Mexican, Southern Mexican border or the Northern Mexican border or in the US. And, um, and so I thought a postscript slash coda might be the solution. And then, you know, I read the end of the Essence, the Darien Gap part of the piece, which was when they were in the Panamanian migrant camps and several of the Cameroonians are getting on a bus to leave um, for the northern pa Panamanian border. And I thought it was the perfect ending. Um, and it's the ending that's in the piece. And, you know, they're hopeful, they're optimistic. And I knew that California Sunday readers, I knew that almost any reader would know that there was a huge gap between their hope and optimism and what they were about to face. And that this was a classic example of what was unspoken and unsaid would be much more powerful than what was explicit and said. And, um, and I was absolutely convinced that this was true. I am still convinced that this is true. Um, but I also wanted to you know, honor and recognize that Nadia felt differently and, um, and that she had you know, made this huge commitment and investment in this piece and took extraordinary courage, um, what she did. Um, that cannot be understated in any way. And so I asked her to write the coda um, and, um, and then presented it to the executive editor and the editor in chief of California Sunday and said, could you take a look at this? And I was very careful not to convey my view about this or Nadia's view. I said, can you take a look at this in the context of everything you've now read? And they both came back saying, no, 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 the original ending is stronger 
um, you know, the code is interesting, but actually takes away from the the hyper concentration of the of of this piece being about the Darien Gap, um, and um, and you know, how I had to call Nadia and say we all felt strongly that it was a much stronger piece without. And um, I, I know Nadia didn't agree, um, but trusted me at that point. Um, and um, and I actually don't know to this day whether Nadia at this point still agrees or disagrees, but that's where we were, so. Can you reveal that, Nadia? And then we'll ask a couple of questions from the chat. Yeah, no, I, th I think that um, in terms of what the story became, um, for being a story about the Darien Gap, it was it was appropriate that it it ended there. Great. So the question is from Paula Dwyer, and her question is um, for Kit: did, uh, did you assign Nadia a word count? Uh, what were your space constraints, and did you have any issues with your own top editors? Um, I'll answer those backwards. There were no issues with the top editors. It was an extraordinarily light back edit. It was you know the kind of back edit that. All of us want, which was there. Certainly, probably there were play, tiny places where we over-explained or under-explained, um, and you know, editors get lost in the tunnel just as much as writers do at a certain point. And so it was really valuable to get those notes, but they were very small notes. Um, the I think the I can't remember what the original con contract was, but we always imagined it initially as a seven thousand seventy five hundred word piece. Um, Nadia delivered considerably more than that. Um, and, um, and so I, um, but I began to edit it to the size that I thought it was right. As it turned out, it was roughly 7,000 or 7,500 words. But at that stage, I thought it was, had the potential of being such an extraordinary piece, I was gonna edit it to the length that I thought was right for the piece and make my argument with the, edit, with the editor if I needed to. It turned out I didn't need to. So there were no space constraints. And one of the extraordinary things about California Sunday is was its art and photo department. And um, there were three photographers involved with this project. Um, and one of the things that California Sunday became quite well known for was that how it used its photography to help tell the story itself, to not just enhance the story, but also become another form of the narrative. And so California Sunday was always going to give this enormous amount of space and it did. Thank you, Kit. We have great questions in the chat. Uh, one more about the writing process and then we will go back to the reporting with uh, questions in the chat. Nadia, uh, you've told me before that Kit allowed you or helped you to extricate yourself from the piece. Can you um, elaborate on that? Sure, so, you know, as, as we had discussed, um, Kit and I really wanted the piece to be centered on on the migrants experience and we wanted me to basically be invisible um, in the story. I did not want readers to be thinking about my journey. I wanted them to be thinking about the migrants journey. And when I started drafting the piece, there were quite a lot of scenes where I found it difficult to not explain, basically to explain the scene in such a way um, where I wasn't there because some of the, the interactions actually really did directly involve me. And so I ended up writing my first draft in first person, tried to use it as lightly as possible, but it was in first person. So people knew I, I, I was there. And um, Kit was able to find some really creative ways to be able to um, extricate myself entirely and make this purely observational. And one of the, I don't know if you want to um, talk about this kit, the, the scene with George, um, where I was actually there, um, but we, and Kit was able to find a way to describe this so that it was you know, transparent that George was talking to, to guides, he was getting help from guides, um, but we found a way that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to place myself there. Um, and I think that the piece became so much stronger because of that. Um, there's a lot of people who have asked me if I was actually on this journey. <laughs> and I love getting that question because to me, um, it shows that, you know, they really weren't thinking 
about what I was doing during, during this process. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that. Let's go to back to the Daring Gap, to the reporting process and the logistics. Uh, Hendrik wants to know, uh, what were some of the security measures you put in place before and during the trip? Um, and uh, how do you to stay in touch? Um, how do you decide to pack? What do you decide to pack and all, all of those? Logistics. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be, um, I'll try to be brief on this. Basically, we decided that um, there were two kind of major safety concerns. One was the actual, um, I would say physical concerns. So the actual terrain and what kind of risks that could pose. Um, so we're talking wildlife. Um, we knew that a lot of people do die of venomous snake bites. Uh, people drown frequently, there's landslides. So there was that bit, and then there was the risks from um, two-legged creatures, humans. Uh, we knew that there were basically systematic um, sexual assaults, robbery um, at machete point, gunpoint happening every single day on, on the trail. And so the way that we tried mitigating these risks was, um, and I think the most important decision in all of our planning was who were we going to hire as guides. So we needed these guides to know the terrain incredibly well so that we wouldn't get lost. We needed them to be trustworthy so that they wouldn't abandon us. And um, we also needed them to be kind of well-respected in local circles. So um, our sense was that if we, if we came across bandits, um, if we were with people who these bandits who also were um, kind of known to be locals, if they perhaps had a reference point for each other, we might be in a lot better shape than if they were complete strangers to, to the region. So we were really lucky in that Carlos, the photographer, um, he had done years of legwork in the Darien Gap and had found guides who he had already crossed with and who were, you know, he really trusted his life with. And so many of our reporting decisions revolved around them. And we really let them kind of dictate the pace of the trip. Um, and we let those safety concerns um, really guide the trip. Um, just really quickly in terms of, of packing. Um, so there, we tried to pack as light as possible, obviously, um, one, one change of clothes, um, camping gear, and in terms of, you know, materials that we brought, um, we, we had to, there was no electric power signal, obviously on, on the trail. So we had to bring an unbelievable amount of camera batteries. Um, we knew that our cell phones weren't gonna work. We rented a satellite phone and we also had a GPS tracker where we pre-programmed um, a choice of three messages that we could send. And so every day we tried to send a message um, to our producer at PBS NewsHour. Um, this was often more challenging than we had envisioned because the canopy was usually so thick that we often couldn't get a signal. Um, and the last thing that we brought um, for safety was very expensive. It's basically anti-venom medication that you can only apply apply through IV. So we also had to carry a lot of IV bags. Um, and that's an example where, you know, if we hadn't been doing this with, um, you know, without Pulitzer Center support, we never would have been able to, to afford that medication. Thank you. We have amazing uh, questions in the chat. So Alan wants to know uh, if at any point in the journey, you felt that you had made a mistake that could have been avoided. And what, is, what are your tips for young reporters attempting complicated, dangerous journeys? Um, so I, I can't remember a moment where, where we felt or where I felt like um, we, had, we had done an error that was kind of unavoidable. I, I think with these types of trips, you, you 
you have to expect the unexpected. And um, that's not to say that there weren't lots of hiccups along the way, but I think that when that happens, it's important just not to freak out and um, to remember that it's part of the process. Um, and so I think that for, you know, people who are planning ambitious reporting trips, um, I think that part of it is, is remembering that mistakes will happen, um, you know, mess ups will happen, and that they're often recuperable. Um, they're not necessarily the end of the world. I will share that um, I did make a a very strong technical error um, at the end of the trip when we were in the, the camp for migrants in Panama. Um, Bruno and I were, were doing filming. I was recording on a voice recorder, separate interviews for the magazine. Most of our camera equipment had broken or become damaged um, by water at that point. And we had to mix all of these different microphones and basically do a, a whole makeshift system. And in the process, when I was using my voice recorder, it seemed like I forgot to basically shift modes in some of the interviews that I did for my print piece. And so I returned to New York and I discovered that I had lost, I think it was 11 hours of some of the best interviews. Um, I had done. They were they were on the recorder, but they were completely inaudible, and I literally had a heart attack and um, felt like it was the end of the world, and that I was, you know, holding this incredible and important story, and that, you know, I had it just wasn't going to be possible anymore, and so. I will say, you know, to anybody that um, encounters these kind of disasters along the way, um, it, 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 there's always a way for it to work out in, in the end. And it turned out that, you know, there was an abundance of, of material and we could, we could work around that tape loss. I'm sure we all identified with that uh, panic moment. Yeah, um, terrifying. Kid, a couple of questions for you. Um, about, uh, first of all, like a little bit more on how you help a reporter extricate themselves from a piece. And also um, uh, you mentioned that there were a couple of other previous stories on this subject. So um, um, how do you decide when it's worth doing your own version of a story uh, or something that has already been done? I'll answer the second question first. Um... Both those stories weren't about the migrants coming through the Darien Gap. And so I thought there was an enormous opportunity to do something both quite extraordinary, but really valuable and really important. Um, and so in this case, it was a really easy decision. Um, one was seven years old, one was, I think, two and a half years old, and both had completely missed what I thought was the most important story. Um, you know, I don't think there's an easy answer to when you think something has been done. I think climate change reporters face this question every day, which is on one hand, um, it is so written about, and many people are numb to it. And on the other hand, it is so important. You know, it's not too much to say that the fate of the world depends on how we respond to climate change, that you have to continue doing it. So the question isn't whether you're done. The question is, how can you do it in a way that will make people pay attention? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, that's a different question. As for how do you extricate yourself? Um, in some ways, it's a kind of simple technical trick, which is um, you can write the piece the first way, which is you are there. They are talking to you. You are a participant. And then try to write the piece either neutrally, where you've removed yourself, or over the shoulder of a character. And um, and one of the interesting things, um, you know, in the process of editing the piece with Nadia is that about halfway through, while Nadia was writing and I was editing, um, I asked her. She had so extricated herself from the piece at some point that that the kind of sensation of walking through 
the rainforest and climbing up these extraordinarily steep and slippery trails were all, had almost been stripped out of the piece. Mm -hmm. And um, and I wasn't interested in how Nadia navigated that. I wanted to know uh, how the Cameroonians, the Pakistanis, who were principal characters, navigated that. So I said, you know, tonight, you know, stop writing after dinner, pour yourself a glass of wine, or even during dinner or while cooking, um, and just sit down with it, whatever is the most comfortable thing, a yellow pad of paper, your laptop. And, um, and then I had a set of questions. What was it like to, how, you know, how, what was the humidity like? What was it like to go up, you know, slip on those, uh, those trails? You know, and just write yourself some notes about that. Just don't worry about perfect sentences. Just write those sensations down. And then let's figure out how to way we get those sensations in the piece, but they're not about you. Um, and so there are lots of different ways you can do it, but I, some of it's just technical, you know, write the piece and remove yourself or do it over someone's shoulder. So, um, Nadia, um, just very quickly, um, I think is, let me see who asked this question. Um, I think Genevieve, uh, wanted to know the timeline of the whole story, but very briefly, if you can tell us how, how long did you take a with the logistics, the preparations, the trip itself, and then the writing process. Okay, so I think that, um, you know, as Kit mentioned, the actual pitching and approval process was really, really quick. Um, we had been planning to go to the Derian, I believe like as soon as maybe three weeks, three or four weeks after the pitch was approved, which was really, really tight considering there were so many moving parts and the biggest moving part was actually our guide. So they ended up being, the head guide was like out of communication with no cell phone signal for two weeks. And um, he came back and said, you know, the area is just kind of, um, it's just chock full of security. You're gonna get caught. We, we have to postpone until they stop doing so many operations. Um, so, we postponed our trip, I think once or twice. And um, I think we went probably a month and a half after pitch approval. Um, then I was on the ground in Colombia and Panama for three weeks, I believe. Um, a few weeks later, I went to Southern Mexico, spent another two or three weeks there. Um, then I spent a couple of months working on the PBS NewsHour series while, you know, still trying to keep up with my characters and, and report on their journey um, and, you know, rewrite my notes. But I think that I earnestly, when I started writing to the time that I was able to give Kit these chunks <laughs> of the draft, I think was one month perhaps. Um, and those chunks were all like 10, in between five and 10,000 words. And I mean, Kit had to do like the most express edit. And I think, you know, then it went really quickly, right Kit? I mean, I think it was yeah. maybe- I think I, I looked at the dates this morning. I think, you know, I th you began to deliver mid late January, and um, and 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 we're maybe yeah late January early February, and we delivered it to the copy desk in early March, right before COVID hit. Actually, wow. Um, Caroline, I have your question. I'm going to go to it in a second, but um, since we're talking about the magazine and the editing process. Um, Jill wants to know how did you know that Kid and California Sunday were the right choice, and um, did you try pitching um, elsewhere? No, I didn't try to pitch elsewhere. I really felt strongly that this was this was a perfect story for California Sunday. Um, I really admired their long form. I knew that they were ambitious, and I felt like they took chances on stories. Um, so that's that's what and you know as I mentioned I'd already worked with Kit I knew he was a great editor um, so it was a very easy it, it wasn't like a decision on my part I was like yes this is a, this is a story for California Sunday I'm going to send it to Kit. Let me add one other thing which is that California Sunday's 
mission was to write about the American West, Latin America, and the Pacific Rim. And there were a lot of reasons for that, but it was one of the few national publications that certainly in magazines, whether it's in digital form or print form, that made Latin America um, a central part of the region that it covered. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And nothing against the New Yorker, but that's not true of the New Yorker. It's not true of the Times Magazine, not true of the Atlantic. Um, and it was one of the things that distinguished um, <coughs> California Sunday from many of its competitors. And one of the reasons why we missed the magazine. Um, from Caroline Chen, um, Nadia, can you tell us more about how you built rapport early in the journey? You said you waited to ask for interviews, but how did you indicate that you were just getting to know people, not in reporter mode? So um, yeah, maybe I should clarify. I guess you know I was in reporter mode. Um, I was completely upfront with with everybody about who I was, and I was also you know with a videographer um, and and a photographer who you know were always carrying around equipment. Um, I think that you know I I had two different reporting processes for the television part and for the magazine part. And so with the, with the television part, I knew that, um, you know, if you, if you don't get the footage like in situ, then there's, there's not a story. And so those interviews um, had to happen in, in the Darien Gap. Um, and I think that one of the things that made this experience less stressful was I never had the expectation that for the magazine piece, I was going to be carrying out the really, really long in-depth interviews yeah. that any long form feature is going to require. I never had the expectation that I was gonna do that on the trail. Um, I had heard that when migrants are on this trail, they are really, they are gunning it and they're not gonna be interested, you know, when they're hungry and wet um, and having a pretty miserable time to just stop and chat with a journalist for five hours. Um, and so that's where I just made my goal for um, the, the journey to build relationships with the migrants that then I could pick back up on once we had all arrived in, in Panama. Um, and that's not to say that I didn't ask them reporterly questions on, on the way. Um, and, you know, I often referred to, you know, I'd love to speak further with you when, you know, once we arrive in, in Panama. Um, but I was very much in kind of observer mode. I didn't know who, who my main subjects were going to be. Um, and so I really just wanted to try to um, keep, you know, my eyes very open um, and, and get a feel for, you know, who, who was I kind of feeling the greatest affinity to, who was already, you know, who was I having a connection with already? Uh, Nadia, in the last minute or so of uh, this conversation, I want you to tell us a little bit about um, that extraordinary event that took place uh, months after the story came out in the magazine and after the story came out in the PBS News Hour. It was a only New York kind of moment, and um, I would love to end this conversation uh, with that. Sure. Um, so yeah, this is this is a fun a fun story. Um, it was winter time in New York, and I heard uh, a ring at our doorbell. And um, Bruno and I were living on the second floor of a brownstone, and I kind of you know opened the window and peered my head out and saw a delivery person below. And I hadn't ordered any food, so I explained, you know, I'm sure it's for. For the downstairs neighbors, can you just you know go down the step and, and ring their bell? And he said, Oh yeah, okay, sure, thanks. And he turned around and then he did this, he just kind of swiveled and like looked back up the window and he said, Nadia. And I said, Yeah. And I had no idea who who this person was. Um they wore a hood, they had a mask on, um, you know, they were all bundled up. And um I went downstairs and um, this person, you know, their English was not 
terrific. Um, but he was able to communicate with me, you know, some key words like Darien. And he started showing me his cell phone and he pulled up the first PBS NewsHour piece that Bruno and I had done. And he was pointing at it and, you know, we realized um, not only had he done the Darien Gap trip, but we actually had spent days together walking through the Darien. And the last time that I had seen him was on the side of a riverbank. And he was part of a group of Bangladeshis who we came across. Um, they had been robbed four times. They had no more clothes left, no money, no, um, no food left. And so they, they joined our group. Um, and I hadn't, you know, I hadn't seen him since, since Panama. So the coincidence was just absolutely unreal that here he was, um, on, on our doorstep. And it turned out that, um, he worked out of a restaurant really close by and was moving to, to our neighborhood. Um, and I have since moved. I let him know where, where I was living. And just a few weeks ago, he messaged me and said, you know, I'm in your neighborhood and we saw each other on the street. So that was, that was, um, that was fun. Um, so yeah, the, the chances are basically, basically nil. It's extraordinary. Thank you so much, uh, Nadia and Kate. I, I wish we could continue. Um, but as Kate would say, is, uh, uh, the power of the unspoken and knowing when to stop is, 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 a, is a good skill. So I'm going to follow that advice. Uh, thank you for your leadership. We are truly, truly inspired. And um, thank you also to the Overseas Press Club, to the board, uh, to Patty and to Chad for encouraging this conversation. And with that, I will turn it over to Patty. Um. It was an absolutely fabulous and fascinating conversation. And um, thank you so much, uh, Marina, Nadia, and Kit. And um, we will try to do it again sometime. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone.